Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the UHN Foundation COVID-19 Virtual Q&A. We hope you're staying safe and taking care of each other during these challenging times of the pandemic. I'm Christian Cote, host of the UHN podcast, Behind the Breakthrough. We're so glad you could join us and grateful to you, our family of supporters, who have been so generous since the beginning of the pandemic. So a big thank you from the UHN Foundation and on behalf of all of Team UHN. In today's episode, we look at what is driving the fourth wave of the pandemic, how to keep kids who are returning safe to school, who are returning to school safe from the Delta variant, do we need a third dose of the vaccine and the wisdom of a vaccine passport? Plus, we'll be taking your questions a little later in the program. With us today, we're so pleased to be joined by Dr. Alon Vaisman. He is UHN's infection control physician. Welcome, Dr. Vaisman. Thank you for having me. Okay, two weeks from now, September 9th, all Ontario students are returning to in-class studies. That includes hundreds of thousands of children under the age of 12 who, at this point, cannot be vaccinated. How do you see the spread of the Delta variant playing out in this vulnerable population once they return to class? It's certainly possible, as was seen in other countries, that when schools open up, uh, that we're going to see an increase in cases. And this here in Ontario is coupled with the fact that we already see a rising number of cases in August. So it's likely we're going to see higher community transmission. So the question is, how can we best protect the children? And of course, there's many measures that have been introduced and have been proposed for the schools, many of which that everyone is very familiar with that really just need to be reinforced properly. This includes masking, particularly of older children. It includes good contact tracing, good access to testing, vaccination of everyone who's 12 and over, and also uh, improving the ventilation of the schools. So the, the main message here is that if we are able to prevent transmission within schools and try to minimize transmission within the community, we can prevent that back and forth transmission that we worried about last year during last year's school season. Well, today, you know, I read that the number of children under 12 getting COVID and being hospitalized in the U.S. is on the rise. What's your sense of the possibility of that happening in Ontario once kids are back in class? Yeah, so compared to adults, the likelihood of children being admitted to hospital is relatively lower. So it's about 10 times less likely, or maybe one in a thousand. And then maybe one in 10,000 approximately, unfortunately, will die from COVID. So it is much rarer when compared to adults. However, it's still important that we put in measures to protect them because, of course, those are still significant and important numbers to consider. So the, again, the most important thing is that if we can control the community transmission, we're going to protect our kids. Interestingly, we know from the United States that states that had good adult vaccination actually had fewer kids who got, who got infected. So the more we vaccinate the adults, the better job we do protecting the kids. And of course, another way to protect kids under 12 is working towards being able to vaccinate them. What's the latest that you know of, Alon, on the safety and efficacy data thus far that's ongoing in terms of the trials? So we haven't heard uh, any official data about how safe the vaccines are. We anticipate that, this, that the vaccines are going to be very effective in this age group, just as they've been in many others, because children tend to have good immune systems and good response to vaccination. But as you said, the main question is the, is the safety, is how safe it's going to be. So currently there are trials ongoing from Pfizer and Moderna enrolling children, and the results haven't been released yet. We anticipate, based on their public releases, is that this would be available in September and October. And they anticipated this be around the time, perhaps October, when they um, apply for FDA approval. So we won't know for a few more weeks or maybe two months uh, how safe the vaccines are in children. And so giving you what you're talking about in terms of timelines, uh, needles in arms probably isn't going to be happening much before November. Yeah, November would be very optimistic. Of course, the, if we take the uh, United States as an example of how they rolled out their vaccination compared to Canada, they got approval for these vaccines before we did in, our, in Canada. So the, the uh, manufacturer has to apply for approval here. So that process is likely to start first in the United States. So there's a few uh, barriers that have to be overcome before we can start seeing it here. So in Canada, you know, it's hard to know, but we're looking something no, no earlier than December, it looks like at this point. Okay, so in the meantime, parents in Ontario uh, are again faced with this agonizing issue of how to keep their kids safe. Uh, I actually see that the TDSB today announced that it's moving towards all staff and visitors to schools 
must be fully vaccinated, although the, the timing of that is yet to be determined. In the meantime, what can you tell us about the public health recommendations for schools to ensure Ontario students and teachers are safe? So many of the measures that I mentioned earlier are the ones that have been recommended by experts and public health uh, units across Ontario to keep kids safe. So a lot of that starts with the basics, including good access to testing, good access to contact tracing in case there are cases, having a relatively low threshold to declare outbreaks or to declare uh, a unit on heightened surveillance to be able to investigate what's going on. Masking of children has also been generally recommended in most age groups, and that has uh, it's, it's likely to be very effective, especially to be more effective in the older children. And also the, the push to have proved ventilation. So many schools, many units have recognized this and have reviewed the ventilation of their schools and made efforts to try to improve things because some schools are very old. And the reason that's important is that we know that COVID transmits better in settings where there is poor ventilation. So this is especially true in community settings like schools. I also read recently where the Israeli public security minister recently recommended that country postpone the start of school for children under 12 to October 1st to prevent the spread of the Delta variant. Is that something that you would see as a, as a move that we should be considering in Ontario? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Look, if for Ontario, it, it comes to whether or not delaying it is going to make a big difference in terms of a wave or when we're going to hit a peak of a wave. So if, you know, what, what, is, there, what is the purpose of delaying it? And on, in Israel specifically, part of the purpose is that they currently have a, a heightening of the cases that continues to rise. Furthermore, they have a specific uh, strategy to give third doses to, to adults as well. And so delaying it makes sense in their context because there is a specific target. In Ontario, there isn't a specific target that we're trying to aim for. And the idea being uh, that currently we believe that schools can be safely reopened if those measures are employed. So delaying wouldn't have a strong benefit at this moment. And I think most people in Ontario would agree that one of our primary motivations is to keep schools open for as long as possible in, in, in class learning. And so if we did have to delay or close down schools, we would ideally do that as a last resort when all other measures are not working. So right now there hasn't been discussion in Ontario to delay the opening of schools until October. Okay, so big picture, let's turn to the, the, the wave four that we're now into for the last few weeks in Ontario. The weekly, weekly case count is on the rise again. Uh, what's fueling this latest wave of COVID-19 in the province? It's a, it's a very good question. You know, there's one easy thing that we can point to, and that's the fact that we moved to stage three in mid-July. That's not to say it was the wrong move or that it was unsafe, but there is some degree of increased transmission when there is more contact between individuals. So although they're very wisely put in uh, limit restrictions in the indoor and outdoor settings, it's inevitable that the transmission is going to come back. The speed at which it comes back and the amount of cases we see is dependent on many variables, but one of the most important is the vaccination numbers. So the reason that we're seeing cases now, it's kind of the invariable uh, uh, transmission that we see as more contact occurs between people. So hopefully the main finding of this wave is that we don't see the hospitalizations and deaths associated with the other waves because we have a high rate of vaccination. That is really one of the most important things that we're gonna be watching very closely for this time around. And give us a sense of the breakdown or profile of people that are being hospitalized, that are being infected with COVID. So if we just start with the number of cases that have COVID, the proportion is about 20% vaccinated and 80% uh, non-vaccinated. But that number is kind of misleading because it's a, it may suggest that the vaccine is not effective. What it just tells us is that a lot of people are being vaccinated. Over time, we should see more than half of the COVID cases among vaccinated people, simply because the vaccinated people make up most of our population now. So the more important number to look at is what proportion of people who are vaccinated are having uh, COVID. And that number is actually quite small. So we're talking about something less than you know, 0.2 or 0.5%. Among the hospitalized and among the people who are dying from COVID at this point, fortunately, the vaccinated do not make a large proportion. Unfortunately, people are dying of COVID still, and that is primarily driven by the individuals who have not been vaccinated. So it, the vaccine is doing what we thought it would do, which is to protect you against death and hospitalization. There were some really stark numbers, actually, that came out uh, through reporting by the Toronto Star recently that 
it showed that when unvaccinated Ontarians get COVID, their chances of being hospitalized are 20 times greater than those who are vaccinated. And their odds of ending up in the ICU are 70 times greater than uh, people who've been vaccinated. If this 25% of Ontarians continue to choose to be unvaccinated, what do you envision the burden will be on our healthcare system over the next few months? Yeah, it's a very interesting problem that we're faced with right now because the vaccination numbers are very good, but the problem is that the Delta variant is more transmissible and more deadly than previous uh, variants. And so compared to April and May, where we had very little Delta, although it was rising at the time, now it's 90% Delta. So the positive effects of the vaccination will be offset to some degree by the fact that unvaccinated individuals will pick up Delta and unfortunately will have worse outcomes than they had in the past. So I think most people would still anticipate the deaths and hospitalization not to be as severe, but it's very hard to know. So in that percent of the population, uh, and right now it's about 18% of the eligible population are vaccinated, they can, even though they are a small proportion, they can still account for a very large number of people. In Ontario, 18% makes up, you know, two, two and a half million people or so. So that is still a large number. And that, that could very well lead to overwhelming of the healthcare system. And it allows what is, as you point out, predominantly the Delta variant to continue to spread and perhaps morph into an even more serious variant, I imagine. Exactly. So as long as transmission occurs here in Ontario or across the world, there's always the potential for new variants to arise. Some variants are not going to be of any concern. They will not be very transmissible and they'll fade away. But unfortunately, some variants will have an adaptive quality that allows them to be more transmissible or to be more deadly. And unfortunately, that could lead to more problems. So that speaks to the importance of being able to distribute vaccination across the world, not just here in Canada or the United States, in order to prevent the, the development of variants. Of course, the primary reason to vaccinate people across the world is by far is you want to save lives. But as a secondary gain to us here in Canada, it is that we will prevent the transmission of new variants. And you um, mentioned actually the people who have been fully vaccinated and the fact that with the Delta variant, there are still what are called breakthrough infections. But talk to us about the, the, the symptoms and severity uh, of the symptoms with people who uh, are getting these breakthrough infections. infections. Yeah, it's very important to recognize we, we shouldn't be overselling what vaccines do. We should be very clear. The vaccine has a very strong role in preventing death and hospitalization. But unfortunately, in response to the Delta variant, there is some slightly lower ability to prevent any, any kind of illness. But still, the majority of illness among vaccinated individuals is either asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. Okay. Only a small proportion of those people will have severe symptoms like shortness of breath or chest pain or severe breathing problems that forces them to be in the hospital. So when people are thinking about now going into September, what kind of symptoms should I watch out for now that I'm vaccinated? you should keep in mind that you can have very mild symptoms. So if you start having a headache for two days, then it's inexplicable. A sore throat or runny nose for even a day, that could very well be COVID. It's going to be a challenge for a little while for people to get used to that idea and our testing to be able to accommodate the, the, those individuals who are sick. But it's important for people to recognize that so we prevent transmission of the disease. And that's going to be more and more important as the case numbers rise. Let's turn to the issue of a third shot of the vaccine. First, actually some welcome news uh, for a vulnerable group of the population. And it's thanks to uh, UHN's Dr. Deepali Kumar, uh, who is Director of Transplant Infectious Diseases at UHN's Ajmira Transplant Center. Dr. Kumar recently published trial data, data that a third shot of the COVID vaccine significantly boosts protection against the virus for transplant patients. So talk to us about who this could potentially benefit and the ripple effect that this study is already having. Yeah, so here at UHN, of course, we have a very large solid organ transplant population, and this data can very well be extrapolated to other immunocompromised people to some degree. But the idea is that we had a suspicion, and this was based on evidence early on during the vaccination phase in January, February, that those individuals who have immune compromise don't respond as well to two doses, and hence the need for a third dose of the vaccine. The ripple effect this could have is, first of all, providing vaccination for those individuals, more readily. Uh, so those would be the people you want to prioritize for a booster shot. And then also the studies that would support the leading to a studies that would support the vaccination, the third dose vaccination of other individuals who has immune compromise. 
So this study is very important to help support that notion and help justify the approach of choosing these individuals to provide a booster dose earlier and protect them against COVID. And I do want to make mention, because it's really important here, the connection between donor dollars and having an impact, that Dr. Kumar's pioneering research uh, showing that a third dose of the vaccine boosts protection for transplant patients is fueled by UHN Foundation donor dollars. So that's a powerful illustration for everyone out there that when you contribute to UHN research, you become an integral part of advancing treatment and directly impacting, impacting patient care. So kudos to Dr. Kumar and all those who contributed to her study. Okay, Alon, let's turn to the rising call for third shots of the vaccine for everyone. As you mentioned, uh, Israel has already started booster shots for people over 50. Uh, the US authorized third uh, doses of the vaccine starting later in September. What's your take? Is the evidence there yet? So I think there's a lot more evidence to support the vaccination of those who are immunocompromised as we talked about, and likely also for those who are elderly. But as for the general population, there really isn't much data to support that yet. The approach that Israel has taken has been a very proactive approach. And based on some of their data, which has yet to be fully analyzed, it shows that people who are vaccinated early on in January have now have waning immunity and have increased case numbers compared to those who don't, uh, who are vaccinated later, I should say. But that data is confounded by the fact that many elderly people got vaccinated in the beginning. So that may be the explanation. So based on that and based on other studies, like a UK study is just recently done showing the similar waning immunity over the course of six months, the province will also undertake a approach to try to give boosters for those who are immunocompromised, those who are elderly, and those who are living in long-term care facilities. But certainly we don't have the data to support that in the general population, at least not yet. So that may very well be the case, but it may take a few more months when, before that is necessary to be done for the general population. And any move in that regard, we should let the audience know that that, will, that directive will come from the Ministry of Health in Ontario. And for transplant patients specifically in terms of the third shot, uh, keep an eye on uhn.ca. News will be up on the site as that it moves forward. Okay, uh, we keep hearing from some mental or some health experts out there that we can't vaccinate, can't vaccinate our way out of the pandemic. What, what does that mean? Well, I think it's important to recognize that during episodes where you have very high number case number, high case numbers like now, that even when you do have high vaccination rates, you still have a rise in number of cases. So you still need to employ your other non-vaccine interventions in order to try to reduce transmission. So for the time being, things like masking and distancing are going to be very important. And of course, the ventilation in non-healthcare settings, for example, improving the ventilation is also going to be important. Ultimately, if you take a big step back, you look at the entire pandemic, vaccination is the only way out of this. That's the only way you could ever eliminate or even uh, reduce the transmission of, a, of an infection in the long term. It's just that in the short term, in terms of how we're going to approach things here in Canada, you're, you're still going to have to use more than one tool to try to prevent these waves and waves from occurring each time. So, you know, this next few months will be a very telling time for us to see because Canada is the highest, uh, has the most vaccinations on earth. So we will see how a highly vaccinated population deals with a wave of COVID and how many deaths, how many hospitalizations that people will suffer in this context. So the recommendation is first and foremost, get vaccinated, but also in, as a method of reducing spread, even if you are fully vaccinated, you'd recommend we be masked and still practicing physical distancing, even with others that we know are fully vaccinated. Like how do we judge all of that kind of behavior? Yeah, so right now, for example, we're in stage three. And if you look at the stage three recommendations, there are limits to how many people you would be hanging out with or what you could be doing in a public space like a restaurant. So it is important to follow those recommendations about when you're distancing, when you're masked. And keep in mind that this may very well change. If we start seeing a rise in hospitalization and deaths during September, then we will have to pull back. So we will have in public spaces less and less ability to meet. We will have less and less ability to meet with people from not outside our home. So if we go back to stage two or stage one, for example. So, uh, you know, right now it's, you know, you follow the recommendations, but keep an eye on and see what happens, whether or not we have to go backwards on those, unfortunately. Do you have any sense of timing here? Because it's like we're sitting in this limbo waiting for something to happen. Unfortunately, we don't have a good sense. There have been some models that have been published by individuals, but 
for example, the science table in Ontario hasn't published their predictions yet. Yeah. That'll be very helpful. And once they do, we'll have a better sense of what direction. I mean, it's clear that we're going in an up direction with the cases, but really the critical piece here is what do we anticipate in terms of deaths and hospitalization? That is the most important variable to look at at this point. Of course, that includes adults. It also looks at children. We don't want also children to be hospitalized or of course to die of the disease. That will be what drives the public health measures. If we have a predominant wave that is predominantly driven by just cases of with very, very mild illness, that is not likely to justify many of the restrictions. If we have a wave that is accompanied by very high numbers of, of deaths and hospitalization, that will certainly drive us to go back to the restrictions we had earlier in the year. Okay, the introduction of a vaccine certificate or passport, what's your take on the wisdom of introducing this in say Ontario, which has yet to happen? Basically, when you look at some high risk areas, it certainly makes sense to mandate vaccination, just a full stop mandate vaccination. And I'm talking about acute healthcare settings in schools or in some workplaces where, where transmission is likely to be at risk. And of course, long-term care facilities. That doesn't apply to all places. There's many public settings where transmission is very unlikely. So it doesn't make sense to me at least to mandate vaccination in those settings, but at least we should be mandating vaccination in those high risk settings. And so a passport, instead of having each of these individual settings come up with their own policies and ways to keep track of people of vaccination, if you have a passport that is provided by either the province or the federal government, that'll make the whole the process very, very straightforward because you don't have to reinvent the wheel each time. So I think it makes sense in order to simplify the work and to harmonize what's being done already by various, indivi various individual groups. So universities, hospitals, long-term care facilities, they are all coming up with their own policies. So a passport would help kind of make the work very simple for everyone. And, and sort of standardize the application too, I guess. Many businesses are now struggling, uh, you know, with return to work policies uh, for the workplace and, and strategies for how, you know, what do they say to their employees in terms of what kind of, you know, vaccination are they going to require? Does this fourth wave affect those plans at all? Certainly it, it can. I think um, a lot of workplaces are looking at what kind of safety measures they have in place and whether they can bring people back safely. And of course, whatever they decide has to be in line with the provincial stage. So whether we're in a stage three, two, or one, for example, but that doesn't mean it can't be done. And of course, there's a broader discussion here to be had about the overall worker approach. You know, do, do people actually want to go back to these offices? What do they like? It's, you know, that kind of culture, is that going to return? But from a safety perspective, there's certainly going to be many workplaces where it's safe for people to come back, even if cases arise. The question is, how much restriction are we going to get from the government? And are we going to go back to where we were earlier? And again, that all goes back to whether we see higher cases of deaths and hospitalization related to the, to the, the upcoming wave. Right. I, I see a lot of questions piling up in Slido alone. So I'll make this my last question for you. Sure. There are also health experts out there who say the coronavirus is going to be here for a long time, perhaps with us forever. What's your take on that and what it means for us in terms of living our lives? I think uh, there isn't any evidence to say right now that we could eliminate this virus. And every the experience so far suggests, based on other respiratory viruses, this is just going to be here essentially indefinitely. The goal would be then not to eliminate the virus. The goal then is to make sure that we minimize harm associated with the virus. And really the best way to do that is vaccination. So there are other uh, respiratory viruses we experience from year to year, and some of them do kill people, but for the most part, we can minimize the harm associated with them by employing you know, contact tracing and safety measures that we do in, in very high risk settings. So I think we, we can certainly get used to the idea of living with a virus if we can have a high enough vaccination rate that we don't see a lot of people dying or being hospitalized. That is really the number one goal is to minimize that as much as possible. So one of the key measures then going forward will be we have to really know how to calibrate the booster shots going forward. Exactly. I mean, annual vaccination is nothing new because we do that for flu. And that's for different reasons, because flu, we have antigenic drift and shift, which means that we have to get different strains vaccinated for us. But COVID can be have the same approach where we have an annual shot given to you if it, if it turns out that that's necessary based on waning immunity. 
you know, where all the other measures are going to fall, it's, it's unclear. Where are we going to be with masking in a year or distancing? Are we going to have to do that for the rest of our lives? It seems unlikely, but it's too early to tell when those things are going to be dropped. Understood. All right, let's get to our audience questions and we'll do our best, everyone out there, to get to as many of them as possible. I know there's a lot of demand out there. Um, first question, recently some experts have indicated that the surgical masks we commonly wear in the community due to COVID are only considered 10% effective due to the fact that they don't fit well, gaps, etc. Is this a correct conclusion? And if so, what do you recommend instead? Uh, 10% seems very low, but um, if you look at what's called ASTM levels, which is the official testing method for surgical masks, what's quoted for level one, two, and three is, is actually much higher than that. So if we look at something like a level three, which is what we commonly give at the door here at UHN, the quoted uh, particle filtration efficiency is you know close to 100%. It's like upwards of 96, 97, 98%. So for most settings, wearing a surgical mask is certainly fine. Certainly in the public, that is the recommendation. Surgical masks are really the standard now in most, most places. Um, so I have no concerns of people wearing surgical masks in public. It is important to fit the mask to your face well. It's important to mold the bridge. It is important to make sure that the mask is not damaged or contaminated in any way. But certainly surgical masks are the standard. And Elon, can I just ask a follow-up to that? What would you say to, again, still double masking when you go outside? Um, I think everyone has their own kind of risk threshold. Some people feel more comfortable wearing two masks. Personally, I don't wear two masks, nor would you recommend that in a hospital setting. But, you know, everyone's free to do whatever they want. I, I don't believe that it's necessary to wear two masks in public settings, especially given that most public settings are large and well aerated. So, you know, that, that's up to each individual. They, people need to feel comfortable going out in public. But personally, I don't recommend it. Fair enough. Uh, next question. Our extended family has all been fully vaccinated. We have grandchildren in daycare. Can we safely get together indoors and unmasked during this fourth wave? Yeah, the, the fourth wave can mean a lot of things now. Right now, this, the uh, vaccine, the sorry, the case numbers are comparatively lower. They are rising, of course. So doing these activities is consistent with our stage three opening, and it is safe for now. The question is what happens later on. Certainly, if you're vaccinated, your likelihood of dying is very low. So I would imagine that as we go, as Canada experiences this fourth wave and we have more experience with it, then we're going to see some recommendations around what to do if you're fully vaccinated versus not. Certainly in the U.S., in the earlier this year, the CDC issued guidelines that were based on your vaccination status, your ability to not mask at all, for example. But we'll see what happens now, whether the Canadian government or the provincial government takes a similar kind of approach. So I'd say for now that is safe, but we just have to think about, you know, what happens in the future. It's likely to be okay, but we'll see how many cases come up here in Ontario. Next question. The news reports that some fully vaccinated people are in ICU. Can we know what age those people are and if they have prior illnesses? Yeah, that's a great question. Some of that data is available, but the main message there is that, first of all, it's rare that people who are fully vaccinated in the ICU. Second of all, the people who do have worse outcomes who are vaccinated are those individuals who do not are who have a poor response to the vaccine. And usually it's not young, healthy people. Usually those are uh, either elderly people or people who have an immune compromised state. So that's that's generally speaking, the people um, who will get more sicker. Of course, it could happen in somebody who's young and healthy and fully vaccinated. It's just much, much rarer now. Next question from Sheldon. We are now moving to a COVID booster shot for all. The timing seems to overlap the traditional season for the flu shot. Are there any concerns about conflict between the two vaccines? As far as we know, there's no specific concern between getting a flu vac uh, about getting a flu vaccine at the same time as a COVID vaccine. Um, the mechanisms by which they work are different. The flu vaccine could be an inactivated virus, and the, the COVID vaccine that we generally use here is mRNA, the Pfizer and Moderna. And there isn't really concern of getting vaccinated at the same time, except the fact that if you get two vaccines simultaneously and you have a reaction, it may be hard to distinguish which vaccine you reacted to. So that's why sometimes there are recommendations to separate out the shots, but not specifically because it's harmful to the patient in any way. So, you know, it's great that flu vaccination has increased last year. We had a very high uptake. Hopefully that'll be the same case now. And usually they're released in late October, early November. So 
it's true. It's a great time to think be thinking about flu vaccination too. Next question. Now that we have such high vaccination rates in Ontario and hospitalizations have decreased, is the case count the right metric for us to be focusing on daily? What metric should we be paying attention to? Yeah, the case count is just one, one item to look at, but I think now the more important one will be the deaths and hospitalization. And the reason is that that is the, I mean, that has always been the primary concern, but even more so now we anticipate there be a decoupling between the cases and the deaths whereas before they went up together. Now we anticipate there'd be not as many. In the UK, actually, they experienced a wave of COVID that peaked in around mid-July, and they have a very high vaccination rate, just like Canada. And they saw the real world um, application of this. They saw a very high number of cases without a significant rise of deaths and hospitalization like they had in the past. And that's what we anticipate that'll happen this time as well. But of course, we don't know for certain. So. The deaths and hospitalization is likely to be the more important metric to look at at this time. From Tom, if you assume that the current pattern of vaccination is stable, i.e. most of the willing are vaccinated, what is the expected course of events for the pandemic between now and next spring, uh, barring a new infectious variant? Yeah, the, as I mentioned just now, actually, the most telling experience of what might happen is the UK, where they had a very sharp rise and very interestingly they never actually implemented anything in terms of public health measures so they saw a rise that peaked in around mid-july and it came down on its own unfortunately now they're seeing a rise again but very notably during that rise and during the peak they did not have a substantial rise in deaths so they used generally use a different vaccine than we do but assuming that our vaccine is just works just as well which we assume it is the pfizer and the astrazeneca then it makes sense to think that we would have the same kind of experience. So that's what we we hope will happen over the next few months uh, in the pandemic, but we don't know for certain. Again, it'd be helpful to see the official recommend the official um, models being put out by the science table to help and others to help understand if that's the case. And that again, do you happen to know, Alana? Like, is that coming soon? The modeling? I think part of the issue is that they've been working over the summer to try to come up with the best models. There's multiple models that they review. I don't know when, but I would anticipate it would be sometime in early September that we would see the numbers officially. Um, uh, so hopefully we have a, a better sense very soon. Okay, uh, next question. I received the Pfizer vaccine for my first dose and Moderna for the second dose. Now I'm hearing that there never was any data to support mixing the mRNA vaccines. Am I fully vaccinated or not? What options do I have now if I want to travel? So effectively, the mRNA vaccines are interchangeable. Although, as far as I know, there wasn't a randomized trial looking at those two specifically, whereas there was with the mRNA and the AstraZeneca mixing, the, 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 the vaccines are almost identical, really. So they work the same way. And in terms of how they work on the body, how they provide immunity is, is identical. And it's true if you want to be a purist around the data, we don't know for certain, but everything suggests, everything we know about the vaccine suggests that they are interchangeable. And so these two are WHO approved vaccines, so they should be approved for travel if the country that you're going to uh, has approved the WHO list for receiving people. And in terms of travel, I know that's something probably you need to be mindful of checking before you leave because every country seems to have its own uh, standard in terms of which vaccines and how you can mix uh, in terms of coming into the country. Absolutely. Uh, next question. I'm considering flying from Toronto to Vancouver in two weeks. How risky is this? Should I wait and travel at some other time in the future? Yep. It, it, it's hard to know what we're going to be at in two weeks. Certainly the case numbers are going to be higher here and they're going to be higher in BC but they are going to be relatively low. So from a safety perspective, as long as you're fully vaccinated, certainly the government of Canada allows you to travel. We don't have restrictions between the provinces at this point. In, in these two provinces, I should say, there, there is um, more restriction in other provinces in the Atlantic provinces who test you before you come in and out. But in terms of the traveling itself, outside of the fact that airline companies want you to be tested or vaccinated, then you certainly could go ahead and do it at I don't think there's a specific risk right now, but it's hard to know where we're going to be at. So again, overall, your risk is lower of having any kind of some bad outcomes if you're fully vaccinated. So it seems like now, right now is as good a time as ever to travel before we start hitting another wave. 
If it's any help to you out there, Anonymous, my daughter just got back from a week in Vancouver. She's <laughs> with us. Um, next question. I'm vaccine hesitant. I've heard horror stories of COVID and of vaccine injuries, deaths. I'm tired of doctors denying vaccine injuries. I'm not an anti-vaxxer. I'm worried about both. It's like a bad game of would you rather would you rather die from COVID or vaccine? Vaccines have risks. What to do? It's a it's a very good question. This is the you know the crux of the issue: of how we convince people to be vaccinated. And it's important to have empathy for the concerns and empathy for you know the long term side effects. Of course, I understand why people are worried about that. What I can say is that. From vaccines, the most common, the vast majority of side effects from vaccines occur within the first 45 to 60 days. And we have not seen any permanent side effects occurring within that time period, nor have we seen that occur over a longer period of time. Now that we know that people have been vaccinated since, you know, back in December, for example, there was a really good study. You know, if this individual is interested in reading in the New England Journal that just came out yesterday from Israel, where they make direct head to head comparisons of people who are vaccinated and not vaccinated. So it's a great it's a great point that this person made. It's a bad game of would you rather, but there they made a direct comparison of people who are vaccinated and not vaccinated. So in other words, it takes into account the fact that you may get COVID if you're not vaccinated. You may have a bad outcome, and it was undoubtedly that people who were vaccinated had overall better outcomes for most of the serious side effects that we worry about, like hospitalization and death, or you know requiring to be intubated, for example. So. It's very clear that in the setting that we're in, that vaccination, any kind of concerns about side effects are outweighed by the benefits. There are very few side effects in general. Um, the most important one that we think about is for the AstraZeneca, of course, that has a side effect of clotting. And for the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine, in young men, there is a, there is a risk of having what's called myocarditis, which is generally speaking self-resolving. Outside of those two, there aren't any other serious side effects that we are concerned about. So, you know, it's very common to get mild side effects with those. Absolutely. In the first day after you get vaccinated, you're going to feel crummy, but that goes away very quickly. So I think if you look at that kind of study, you, you ask yourself, would you rather that kind of study answers your question? Very good. Next question. I'm a senior who is double vaxxed. My friends and extended family, not including the kids are all double vaxxed. Am I being overly cautious, not one to drive with others in my car or eating in an indoor restaurant with any of them? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, treating somebody who's unvaxxed as having infected is not exactly that accurate, especially when the cases aren't high. So simply being unvaxxed doesn't really, you know, depending on what you're doing may not put you at increased risk. I would say that it's all depends on your risk threshold and how much you trust people. So if you have family who is not vaccinated, you know, and it depends on what kind of activity you want to do with them, you have to evaluate that for yourself, whether you believe that the risk of being with them is higher than, you know, the, the joys or the benefits of spending time with them. You know, even asking people about symptoms is maybe helpful for you to understand, you know, how are you feeling, if they're feeling sick, that, that's just basic courtesy, not to go to work or not, not to hang out with people when you're sick. So it's a tricky thing to manage. There's, there's no easy answer to this, but at least now, at this very moment, we could be reassured that the cases aren't dramatically elevated. And so it's safe to, to do that, those activities for now. So that would be my advice to this individual. And I guess the other sort of reassuring, in, in the reassuring column is being double vaxxed, even if you were to be infected, by and large, your symptoms would be hopefully fairly mild. That's right. Next question. Some people still wash, wipe, purchases, foods, products, and their clothes and vehicle interior after a shopping trip. Is this still recommended? If so, why do stores still wipe down various surfaces such as carts, counters, etc.? What is the latest on surface transmission? That's a great question. So the, the overall thought is that transmission through fomites, which are these inanimate objects, is, is considerably lower than what we thought about earlier or what we think about for other viruses. So wiping down things when you get home is not really necessary. The only thing you really should do is wash your hands before you eat and try avoiding touching your face, which is generally a good idea regardless of COVID or no COVID. And why do they do this at stores? Well, it may make sense in some settings to wipe down surfaces in some areas of some stores. So areas that are very high touch that people are commonly putting their hands on, it may be helpful to wipe down those surfaces. Perhaps for COVID, it may not make a, as big a difference when we have low cases, but there are other viruses that you could transmit through these services. 
but yes, there's a lot of overwashing and overwiping we see at stores of items that are not commonly touched or services that are commonly touched that really is not necessary. So, and sometimes stores are doing it to help reassure you that they're being active in protecting you against COVID or other diseases. So again, the most important thing is to wipe high touch surfaces occasionally. And before you, when you get home, you don't need to wipe any objects that you brought in from, from you know, outside. I mean, the surfaces, but it does make sense to wash your hands before you eat, of course. Absolutely, yeah. Next question, what are the reasons a patient would qualify for a medical exemption from an mRNA COVID vaccine? There's really two that would, two common ones, I should say, two common reasons why somebody would be exempted. One is that if they're proven to have an anaphylactic reaction, which means a severe hypersensitivity or severe allergy to a component of the vaccine, and, and we're talking about mRNA vaccine, we're talking about PEG, which is a commonly used agent anyway, very, very rare to be uh, anaphylactic against that. The second would be is if you had a severe reaction after having your first dose. And I'm just referring to the mRNA vaccines. Of course, if you had the AstraZeneca, you had a clot as a result of the first dose of AstraZeneca, that of course would be not a reason not to get the second one. But with the mRNA vaccines, it's really just having a proven reaction to a component of the vaccine or having had a reaction to the vaccine itself after you got the first dose. There is a risk of the myocarditis I spoke about earlier, generally speaking in younger men, mm. uh, but that's more common after the second dose. So when people will start getting third doses, that may be, may be more relevant, but it's not really that common at this point. From Phyllis Burke, a very kind question for you, Alon. How are staff doing? You must be exhausted. You're on the wards a lot. You're, you're seeing the nurses and doctors and uh, physiotherapists out there every day. What's what's the latest? I, I think that a lot of people were thankful that the summer was light and they could take time off. Um, certainly a lot of people at UHN took vacations and that was great. People can relax. The thing is with the fourth wave is that there is a mounting frustration now because as opposed to previous waves, this one is a potentially avoidable if we mm. simply had more vaccination. Mm. I think that is the main source of stress for people right now. People, I think healthcare workers are, you know, they're great people. They generally accept the idea that you have to look after sick people, even if it's a lot of work. I think people are up to the challenge. But the facet that's the most challenging to swallow is that, well, this could have been avoided if simply more people got vaccinated. So that's really the hard thing to kind of digest right now. So the what we can do to help healthcare workers is to encourage everyone we know to get vaccinated to prevent this wave from being a very bad wave as others have been. Well put. Next question. Wondering if they can figure out a way to make the vaccines last longer. What's preventing this? If COVID can't be eradicated, vaccines effic efficacy runs low after three months. We're on a hamster wheel spinning four shots a year forever. Miraculous, they came up with the vax, but can we expand on the miracle? That great question is what can we do to make the vaccine better or last longer? There's certainly other modes of delivery like intranasal or oral vaccine, which may be better at protecting us or maybe longer. It may be that we need to change the formulation of the mRNA, for example, that's in the vaccine. So there are many studies, of course, performed by the drug companies who are producing the vaccines to look at those very questions. How do we make the vaccine more durable? Uh, it seems to me unlikely that we're gonna have to get three shots a year. The more likely scenario that it seems is that you might get one shot a year going forward but that's still not clear yet. So I'm not an immunologist, so I don't know exactly what the methods might be that they're trying to improve, but you know, suffice it to say, people are looking into that very question. And it, again, it all depends on what happens with our cases. Once the majority of the world gets vaccinated, we should already start to see a drop in cases worldwide. And that will change the dynamic of the pandemic dramatically. Right now, what we're doing, it may seem like we're spinning our wheels, but we are waiting for the rest of the world to get vaccinated. And again, hopefully Canada can play a role in helping that, that problem. But once, the, once more and more people around the world get vaccinated, the overall burden of disease is going to start to drop. And this concern from variants is going to drop as well. Right. From Trudy, what is an antidote test? Where can you get them? Should I get one? I'm immune compromised. So uh, I'm not sure what they mean by an antidote. Maybe they're referring to an antibody test. An antibody test would be one where you can actually test uh, whether you have an antibody against COVID. 
And so this is sometimes used in studies to determine whether somebody's immune after having been vaccinated or after having had an infection. So for example, in um, the Dr. Kumar study that you mentioned earlier, one of the aspects is to measure the antibodies. And in many studies, antibody measurements are done to determine immunity. It's not generally available to the public, although it, it can be ordered, it's generally done as a research test. So if this person is specifically concerned, they can ask their physician about whether they can order one for them. But as far as I understand, it's not readily available because it doesn't really change your management at this point. It may change our management if we incorporate that into the decision about whether somebody should get a third dose or not. But at this moment, that's not currently part of the process. Another uh, antibody question for you, Alon. My first dose was Pfizer. My second dose was, I'm going to say, Moderna. But neither vaccine dose had any side effects, no sore arm, no temperature increase, et cetera. I am, 72, I am 72 years old. Should I infer from this that my antibody count is not very strong due to age? It's a great question. Uh, I wouldn't infer that you didn't respond to the vaccine. Certainly, if you're older, you're, you're at more risk of that. But the vast majority of elderly people responded generally very well to the vaccine. And this is proved in how few cases and how few deaths we have in our long-term care facilities who got vaccinated very on, very early on during the pandemic of, of this year, I should say. I myself didn't have a strong reaction. I almost had no reaction after my two doses. So I, I don't think you need to get tested for an antibody. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean you didn't respond. So it's totally fine if you didn't have any symptoms or any side effects from the vaccine. Consider yourself lucky. Uh, from Mary Jess, is there data from the recent increase in cases suggesting that a vaccine brand against another is better at protecting fully vaccinated individuals from the virus? Excellent question. Um, as of this moment, there isn't. Um, we know perhaps that there may be a difference between the mRNA and non-mRNA vaccines. And generally speaking, the mRNA vaccines have performed very well. But even between the mRNA vaccines, there isn't one that stands out specifically more than the other in any significant way. So both the Pfizer and Moderna have been very good at protecting you against death and hospitalization and symptomatic disease. So has the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, the Johnson & Johnson, which we have proved in Canada, but it's not really provided here, is perhaps less effective when it comes to symptomatic disease, but all of them provide strong protection against death and hospitalization. So at this moment, there isn't a specific recommendation to choose one of the vaccines over the other. Um, Any one that, you, that you're offered is good. A uh, um, uh, note here from Susie Goulding. <clears throat> Goulding, founder of COVID Long Haulers Support Group Canada a community of over 14,100 long haulers. How can we find information on where, of where rehab clinics are located across Ontario? How long are wait times to get in? Can we establish a direct line of communication to be updated? Do you have any insights here, Alon? I don't know exactly about wait times or how you can connect to them, but every most hospitals, including UHN, would have developed a clinic that helps with uh, patients who have developed symptoms as a result of having COVID. So in some hospitals, it's run by the ICU docs who, so for example, here may, may take an interest in symptoms who have been persistent for many months. In some hospitals, it may be managed by um, specialists in rehab, for example. So it's a great question. The best person to ask would be your primary care physician who would put you in contact or make a referral to one of these clinics across the city. If you, if you yourself believe you have symptoms associated with uh, having had COVID, that would be the best place to, to go to. In terms of a broader advocacy group, I, I'm not familiar and I, I can't provide any specific contacts for that. Okay, next question from Diana. Shouldn't all high school students be mandated to have COVID vaccinations just like the other the other needed vaccines like MMR, chicken pots, et cetera, to attend school. I'm not asking about those under 12 years of age, just high school age students. Yeah, personally, I agree with that sentiment. I think in high risk settings, vaccine mandates make sense and schools would be one of those high risk settings. And I, and certainly, you know, why do we, why do we make those other vaccinations mandatory? It's for historical reasons. So why couldn't we add COVID? Well, we certainly could add COVID to that re that list. It doesn't, doesn't really, uh, you know, there's no specific harms associated with that. Of course, uh, we have to understand that in younger kids or in younger, less than 12, we don't have the, the data yet to establish safety, but certainly in 12 or older, 
I certainly think it makes sense to mandate vaccination in that group because there is more likely to be transmission and in those settings. Next question from Mark. Should the booster be the same type as the previous two shots? Great, great question. We don't know the answer to that. Uh, when we, when countries who have offered the boosting, like in Israel, we're, we're using Pfizer. So we're using the same doses that they got the first two shots. So, you know, we're, we're the literature is developing and the science is moving forward, but we, we don't yet know the answer. Should the boost, must the booster be the same? We know that if you mix an mRNA and a non-mRNA vaccine, you have an excellent response, very durable, perhaps the best of all but we don't know what happens if you add a third shot to that mix. And you know, there's all sorts of permutations you can think of now. We just don't have the answer yet. Uh, if, next question, if a, fully vaccinated if a fully vaccinated individual gets a breakthrough infection from Delta, will they extend or increase the effectiveness of their immunity? Excellent question. <laughs> I have so, not heard that question before. Yeah, there's an, there is an interesting study that was uh, released, well, the preprint was released just this past week, looking at the immunity that you get um, after, so if you've been vaccinated and you get it COVID versus people who haven't been vaccinated got COVID. Right. And in that study, they show that the immunity you get from a non-immunized person is actually better. But that was a study looking at just antibody levels, again, which is a surrogate for the risk associated with COVID, the reinfection risk, for example. Mm. That was just one study. It's not peer reviewed. So the answer to that question is still vague. And really just that one, and maybe for perhaps a few more that might answer that question. But um, presumably having been back, having got COVID and after having been fully vaccinated, it does extend somewhat your immunity because your body does respond to the, to the infection and it does have some kind of, you know, positive immunologic response that, that perhaps might last longer. Next from Irene Stevens, why are we being offered a booster shot of the COVID-19 vaccine when lots of people haven't even had their first shot? And I'm guessing Irene, you're also referring to around the world. Yeah, here in Canada, the philosophy behind offering third shots, again, is for those people who just didn't respond well to the first two and the immune compromise would be that group. So if you didn't get a good response, then you should be offered a third shot in order to make sure you are immunized. But you know, the people who haven't had a first shot in Canada, that's really just the people who've chosen not to. Everyone has access uh, as of, you know, perhaps two months ago or more, actually, there's been enough supply for every single Canadian who's eligible to get vaccinated. Correct. But across the world, it's, it is a good question. The more, the broader question here is about vaccine equity across the world is should we, is it ethical to offer people third shots in the US or Germany or Israel or Canada? Meanwhile, lots of countries have not been given their first shot. And of course, that's a bigger, broader, deeper ethical question to ask. And really, until first shots, at least, if not second shots, are predominantly have, have gone around the world, this, these variants will keep spinning off. Right. Next question. What medicines do we... Sorry. Uh, oh, there we go. Thank you. What medicines do we have in our arsenal that are helpful, helpful for people with COVID? So there, since the pandemic began, numerous drugs have been tried. The three that are generally part of the uh, armament now, one is a steroid, which is considered to be very effective, a long-standing steroid that we've had for many years. And that's given to patients who come into the hospital who require oxygen. A second drug is an antiviral drug that it was repurposed for treatment of COVID called remdesivir. And that's given again to hospitalized patients. And the third is a drug called tocilizumab, which is an immunologic drug that the purpose of it is to try to attack the immune response that your body is increased, that it has, your body has, you know, provided as a way to, to destroy the virus, but has negative side effects on you. So that immune drug called tocilizumab, generally given to severe cases of the disease. So those are the three standard drugs that are used and many, many more drugs are being looked at. Those are all for people who are hospitalized for COVID. As for people who are not hospitalized, there isn't really anything that has yet been approved for use uh, to reduce symptoms or prevent hospitalization. So the horse dewormer drug ivermectin is not recommended for treatment? Yeah, so that whole story is just spun out of very poor evidence that was very poorly cobbled together, and then a lot of internet rumor and speculation. 
That drug, ivermectin, which is commonly used in people as an anti-parasitic agent, is also used in horses as an anti-parasitic agent there as well, but it doesn't have any proven role among people who have COVID either as prevention or treatment when you have severe disease. Next question, I am fully vaccinated. Is it okay to hug my daughter who is also fully vaccinated? We both are following public health guidelines. Yes, I can tell you that a resounding yes, it's, it's perfectly safe to hug your daughter. Of course, the only thing we need to do from now till forever is just be very courteous around symptoms. If you have symptoms, just let people know. But of course, the vast majority of the time, we don't have any symptoms, shortness of breath, cough, sore throat, anything like that. So go ahead and perfectly safe to hug your daughter. Is it true that the COVID-19 virus hasn't been isolated anywhere in the world by any scientists? And if true, what is the PCR testing for? Test testing for? So the, the virus actually has been identified numerous times. It's grown in a lab. So if you provide the virus, of course, like any virus needs a cell line to grow on. If you provided a cell line in a Petri dish, you can actually watch the virus get incorporated into the cell and replicate and you know, cause the problems that the virus causes. In fact, in Canada, the first person to isolate it was up in Sunnybrook in Toronto. So it's, it's been isolated numerous times. And we know the genome, we knew the gene, the, every single base pair of the genome since January of 2020. So a year and a half now, we know exactly the genome of the whole virus. So the PCR testing is picking up only a portion of the genome. So we're looking for DNA fragments of the virus that is sitting in your nose or your throat uh, that is specific to the virus. So that's what the PCR testing does. Uh, next question. I am a heart recipient. I just found out that the Moderna vaccine has a higher concentration. I received two Pfizer doses. Is it dangerous to get Moderna as my third dose? Uh, that's a good question. Again, we don't have a lot of answers about mixing third doses with what you had in your first two. Um, again, based on theoretical evidence, based on theory, it shouldn't be a problem. Um, but, you know, the, probably the recommendation, we, we don't have them formalized yet here in Ontario, but probably when the recommendation comes out, I'm guessing they will attempt to give you the same, to, the same vaccine as you got the first two times until that question is elucidated. But um, in terms of the concentration, that, that doesn't really factor into the efficacy. We know that Moderna and Pfizer are almost interchangeable in terms of their prevention for death and prevention of hospitalization. And so at baseline, they are the same. Just a question of what can you, can you switch them up when you're getting a third booster dose? And we don't know that quite yet. From Sylvia Gold, what are the impediments to the manufacture and administration of vaccines to people in poorer countries? Well, uh, of, of course, a lot of it, even that we saw here in Canada, was that countries don't produce the vaccine in, in the country. So for Canada, we needed to get it from outside, from Europe. And Americans produced the vaccine in their country, so they didn't have to wait for any doses. So any country in the world that relies on production elsewhere, of course, has to rely on transportation of the, of the vaccine. The other important variable is that a lot of countries had deals with the vaccine manufacturers about getting such and such number of doses, even if the doses was far more than what the country actually needed, just like Canada. So companies have a requirement to provide a certain number of doses to a country that was promised to them. And so that leads to some of these countries being back of the line until they finally get anything. There was a, of course, a worldwide push called COVAX to try to get people vaccinated through a central pool of vaccines. Plus, there's other countries who offer vaccines as well to other nations, like China providing vaccines for other countries and doing studies. But the primary reason is the production and the manufacturing is not done in that country, which is a very advanced, te technically advanced thing to do. Well, yeah. along we've come to the end of our time today. To all of you out there, thank you for joining us. And to our expert guest, Dr. Alon Vaisman, UHN infection control physician, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to share your insights and expertise. Thank you for having me. This live stream will be available on the UHN Foundation YouTube page. And of course, donor support is always critical. As we discussed today, your dollars fuel the research initiatives of our UHN scientists working to improve and discover new treatments for patients suffering from COVID-19. So if you're able to give, we ask you to consider making a donation. Go to www.uhnfoundation, that's all one word, uhnfoundation.ca forward slash help. 
Thanks for tuning in. We'll be back next month with another episode. Keep an eye out on, in your email inbox for details. In the meantime, mask up, mask up, keep physical distancing, and please get vaccinated.